I honestly felt I was never going to write another song. Ever. Really? Yeah, sometime during the pandemic. And I hit this kind of wall where I couldn't move forward. And I felt I'd, I'd written my very last song. He first made noise with his breakout single we were all obsessed with, Take Me to Church, earning a rare diamond certification. And since then, it has become one of the top 30 most streamed songs ever on Spotify. Please welcome singer-songwriter Hosier. So I was absolutely at war with myself constantly. Really? constantly. Yeah, yeah. How, how sure. did that look like on a daily basis? Um, what would that mean? It's like I couldn't have a thought without an opposing thought, you know? So it's like my brain was kind of split in two. I'd have a thought and then a thought to come back with that. The artist's question of, okay, like it's knowing that art has such potential to heal. It's easier to just, once you make the conversation with yourself, well, what am I trying to make sense of within myself? Mm. It's quite paralyzing to be confronted with. And um, the great, great question of, will this heal somebody? Will this fix this thing? Mm -hmm. Maybe music is special in that. You can discover a song at any time, mm -hmm. you know? You can discover an artist from the 80s or 70s, 50s. But you gain what you create in that moment as you discover it is something that's spontaneous and is happening now. What is the biggest thing you still struggle with today? <laughs> really great question, but like very challenging one. Um, but yeah, I kind of want to phone a friend. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness. Very excited about our guest. We have the inspiring, iconic Andrew Hosier Byrne in the house, my man. Hey, thank you so much for having so me. So glad that you're here. Um, I remember about 10, 11 years ago when Take Me to Church came out, and it was kind of the anthem for the world, I feel like. It was on repeat on my playlist, on everyone's playlist, and it really catapulted you into another level of success, stardom, financial gain and opportunities mm -hmm. um you know one of the most downloaded or one of the most streamed songs of all time on spotify 13 times platinum diamond certified grammy nominated i mean every type of award you could get you received or were nominated for at a very young age 22 i believe I, right a little bit older i think it was 24 24 yeah. okay so 24 i'm curious if i would have had that much fame success money at 24, I think I would have, my ego would have got the best of me. Mm. I would have probably, I don't know, done things that I would have been ashamed of later in life. I probably would have like, I don't know, just not been the best person with that much. Everyone tell me you're incredible. You're a, a gift to the world. You're successful. How did you navigate success that early and the pressure to live up to some potential? at 24 when the world was watching and listening to you? Yeah, um, I think, thank you. I think, I think first of all, I, I give yourself some credit. I think, um, I think you, I think you navigated very gracefully, you know, and it, it's when you're in that situation, it is, there's something of your makeup or your ingredients just steers you hopefully in, in, in the right way. Uh, but what I will say is that I had really good, I had good friends around me, you know, I had a grounded sense around me. I had a very grounded upbringing. Um, some of this is maybe cultural and some of this is personal, the cultural side of it, it being Irish. Mm -hmm. I was naturally suspicious of kind words being said about me or to me, you know, um, at a time when, especially coming to a city like this or at a time when, yeah, that's the, the song was, was making the rounds and it was, it was, it was a hit. Um, you get a lot of attention and I think my natural response to that oftentimes was not suspicion necessarily, but a kind of a guarded um, skepticism, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so you didn't buy into your own hype. Yeah, that was it. Uh, that's yeah. a good way of putting it, you know. And, and some of that's personal as well, too. I, I, I'm not great at receiving uh, praise. Mm. Working on that as, as <clears throat> time goes on, as life moves on. So it never, I never internalized it, you know, I never internalized uh, the noise around the, the success of the song as something that I would graft onto my mm. person, you know, and um, that's something that I think hopefully stood to me. I could maybe have done with patting myself on the back one <laughs> once. Uh, Did you not give yourself the credit where you just kind of like, well, it's still not good enough or I should be better or I need to do it again? Yeah, it was more that I felt maybe I had I felt like I hadn't because it was the first song I'd ever released. Gosh, that's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. So it felt like, and it's a song I just like I I threw together in my in my parents' attic. I had moved back to I'd moved back home from living in in Dublin, and I realized I did not have 
you know, it was like that point where I was like, okay, long term, I can't keep paying this rent. I'm going to move back if I'm going to be a musician. I was staying with my parents for a brief time. And then, um, yeah, I just threw the song together in my attic. I, what, in like, what, a, a day, a couple hours, a few days? To be fair, I was writing that song for, like, lyrically for over a year. Okay. So, so I had been sitting on this egg, uh -huh. this, like, lyrical thing. Um, but it, it came together musically rather fast. But maybe there was some part of me that felt like, have I earned this? You know, did mm. I, you know, have I been doing this for 10 years? You know, and I, I'd been sitting, I'd been obviously stewing over writing music. I've been writing songs for years at that point. I wasn't sharing them with the world, but I've been writing them in, to myself and for myself. And I had been for a couple of years doing sort of open mic stuff, and uh -huh. working on other people's projects. But it felt very quick and very early. So there was a, a, a an imposter syndrome thing. You know, really? For sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, big time. So that that's probably another thing that, that I was like, okay, yeah, it's it's, you know, Maybe I felt I had more to do, you know? Like you hadn't proved yourself enough and done the reps enough or... Maybe, yeah. But you were doing the open mic for a couple of years, you said. I think you, I saw you were on a, you know, a choir for a while, an orchestra choir for a while yeah. as well. So you had been in music. I think I said, I learned that you picked up a guitar at 15. <laughs> so like at that time, about nine years at least of guitar, singing, songwriting, open mics. Yeah. So it wasn't that you just started the year before. True, true. No, I... I and I, as as time goes on, I'm, I'm I'm able to sort of look back and go, oh, no, you know what I, I I you know, and part of that is is that's a personal journey of going no, like it it happened because I did like I worked, I worked like a like a dog, you know, um to 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 bring that song to to where it, where it got to. Yeah. At the time, I I wasn't I wasn't present in that, you know. Really, um, I don't think so. So in those first, I guess, six months after the song is released, and you start to see this meteoric rise on the song's success, where you're getting invited to all the award ceremonies, you're performing on stages with other big names now, uh, and everyone wants to talk to you or interview you. Mm -hmm. What is going through your mind? Are you thinking, I'm not deserving of this, or I'm not worthy of this, or are you thinking I'm an imposter? I don't know. I think there's some switch that in your brain as so, soon as somebody says, like, you know, I love your song, or I love your, uh, you know, great, great work on that, or whatever. There's some switch in your brain that just like a like this little psychic wall goes up, and the the compliment, the the whatever, the noise, the glitter, and the roar of that moment just hits against that wall and falls falls away. Really, you know? I think so. Yeah, I think. Um, so it's it's a, it's a. Did that if you had that you know that wall? Mm -hmm. Did you feel like it helped you in managing the pressure then because you weren't believing all of it? quickly maybe so maybe so it's there might be a coping mechanism to it in that it's the the flip side of that is is that okay I, you can shrug off then the pressure to be this thing rather than internalize this this being whatever that, that everyone else is experiencing around you as your as yourself that you don't necessarily experience and um, yeah you don't have to deal with the weight of that or the pressure of that or the 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 duality of that maybe you're just like i don't know what you're all what <laughs> what you're all talking about you know i don't know what the hype is and um, maybe that makes it easier so there might be a coping element to it yeah i feel like there's there must be such a pressure for artists on that type of a platform and stage to create meaning around life for humanity to have the answers to society's problems to uh, help people heal with their pain and their problems do you ever felt like you were put in a position to try to, you know, answer the world's problems through your art too quickly before you actually lived life enough. It's a that's a it's such a broad it's such a deep broad question about like about art or it's not its necessarily its purpose you know or or its its potential maybe you know and and the artist's question of okay like like it's knowing that art has such potential to heal and uh, to comfort and to offer a reflection or offer a new perspective or a new window into meaning, especially around suffering. And mm. there's plenty of that in the world. Mm -hmm. I think that that can be a challenge uh, maybe for, for any artist to, even before they step into the creation of a work, 
is is and I've I've definitely felt this is that you are confronted with the potential of that work mm. and and that is uh, it's very difficult and I think it's it's easier to just it, 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 once you make the conversation with yourself um, as to okay well what am I trying to make sense of within myself mm. what is coming up what you know if I pull on this rope what comes up from the well you know what's in that bucket and then okay to 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 try and feel that get a sense of that you know it's it's I think that's maybe that's the the starting place I think it's near it's quite paralyzing to be confronted with um, the the great great question of will this heal somebody will this fix this thing mm-hmm. that's impossible and there is some part of you at some point and I think I don't know if, if you're if you're in, in any way a sort of a somebody who's tends to you know care deeply for people and and or is in any way a people pleaser or is trying to fix people's problems around you there is this you're like oh no I, this must be all things to all people mm. and part of the challenge I think yeah. is, is letting go of that so when you write that you know I'm assuming you'd written many songs before taking me to church you know growing up you're writing songs but that was the first one that you kind of released into the world I guess right were you thinking ever how is this going to impact others when you write a song and put it out in the world, are you thinking more, this is how this impacts me and I just want to share that with others? It was a little bit of both. I think there was two things. There was one thing I wanted, I wanted the song to speak to the legacy of of that institution, of the institutionalized uh, Roman Catholic Church, specifically in Ireland. I didn't think that that song was going to have an international audience. I, I didn't even think that that, that that song was going to have like a broad Irish audience. I, I wrote this song as an unsigned, unknown, uh, you know, artist who was just, I suppose there's a, there was an anger behind it. It was, it was, this is the, you know, knowing, and even did not know the extent of the legacy of that institution. You know, we had like a few years after its release, we're still, if you're familiar with him, um, uh, with a with a, essentially a grave site that they found in a, in a town called Tuam in Galway, uh, where you'd been. Um, oh, I won't go into it now, but like all sorts of stuff with that legacy. So, so what I was just trying to process was the kind of personal it, questions of the personal and the intimate and the, and the romantic and the sexual, and trying to take back what is divine in those things, take back what can be what we might consider sacred in those things wrestling them back from from the uh, from from an institution whose legacy is is so harmful right. um, so it was more that you know and but there was never a I it there was a, a thought as I was writing it that yeah there will be a very very few people who will see what I'm doing here in this song and will appreciate it but I thought it was like I, d- I thought locals in Ireland or something. Yeah, small like audience, pub crowd who's like <laughs> you're gonna go sing an open mic for and sing this song. Yeah, it would be. I was proud of the song, but I, I beyond that, it was more. It was more in conversation with me, and it, it was the, a lot of those lyrics I had in a notebook that I be, had kept with me for a year at that right, point. You know? Right. So, yeah, I, I had interviewed many. Uh, best-selling authors, a, a, a handful who sold five, 10 million copies of their book. I had Liz Gilbert on one time. She wrote the book, Eat, Pray, Love. Mm-hmm. And she did a famous TED talk about how, you know, how to gr- grapple with her best work or her most known work potentially being behind her. Right. Like, cause she sold 10 million copies. It was this global movie. It was like this phenomenon mm-hmm. that took off in the world when, it, when she wrote it. And how to navigate life after potentially what could be the biggest success you could ever have she was like i probably won't write a book again that does another 10 million copies it's very rare to do that have you ever thought about that of like just how to navigate a long career with such a big hit early on and not let needing to chase downloads or streams or charts yeah be the driver for you like your first single yeah yeah, um, it's a it's a tricky one, and and um, and if it doesn't do that well, like, am I a failure? Or is there something wrong? You know, do you ever think about that? Yeah, and you know what? It it's something that you gain. A, it's like a relationship thing as as time goes on. 
I'm kind of laughing to myself. My, my a, a, a member of my label team who's been with me since the very beginning, uh, Betsy is next door, so she's going to hear hear me talk now about it. Yeah, I don't care about strain. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Um, it's you. I, I of course you love that the work is seen, is seen or heard by as many ears as possible if they connect with it. I think um, there is, and there is one part of you maybe that would love that. I think that as, as time goes on, and <clears throat> even then, even 10 years ago, I recognize that this, and this is maybe what's most important to me, is, is that the music that I want to make and the music that I feel moved to make um, does not necessarily, necessarily belong in the spaces of the top 10. Mm. You know, music that is geared towards social spaces and party atmospheres, music that is like oftentimes points towards like an, an aspirational sort of whatever it is. A lot of the time it's club life or, what, or it's it's music that celebrates or engages in like a kind of a conspicuous consuming of of life and its and its and its pleasures, etc. You know, but one that isn't. But he, I can't. I, it would be a bit silly of me to, um, to be all woe is me and want to want to write songs about you know whatever uh, the Roman Catholic Church or songs that 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 it, it, you know um, the legacy of colonialism or 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 occupation or something like that and go why 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 is this in <laughs> why is this hitting the world in charts, the clubs yeah. like yeah um, so but so it's not it's not it's it's just that I don't necessarily feel aligned you know and i'm okay with that and um what i am but this is why i feel like so lucky I, so i'm very much at peace um with it not being th those are as well those are oftentimes those are external those are that's just external validation again it's that thing of like um when i was in that i also wasn't fulfilled in any sort of like by that external validation in a in a very in a personal way yes there is all of these you know it's great and 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 there's wonderful opportunities but i wasn't getting mm. f from that external validation i wasn't getting a voice in my head saying oh yeah now i've arrived and now i feel good about myself and I'm, this would be the same for anybody i'm sure you're you're probably the, the very same um so reminding myself of that, um, you know, helps. But then also just to know that, um, and this is where I feel incredibly fortunate, I feel like I want for nothing, is that I can write, I write songs, I feel on my own terms with stuff that does, I do, you know, move me or I feel as I feel moved to write. It's not exactly subject material all, all the time that, that, that says, come on in, this is easy going, like listening, you know, and, and, and playing around with like, literary influences like from centuries ago and yes i still see that, that i'm selling more tickets now than i was when Ticket really was a hit. yeah like we're i'm selling far more tickets for shows right right go <laughs> man it's cool it's why do you think you're selling more a decade later after you know your first big hit i think part of it is time part of it is there's a whole new generation of people now that are exploring the work who are maybe 10 years 11 years old when the when my first songs came out and they were listening to it then and they yeah. were listening to it and 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 what's what's it's like it's like cool they were listening to it when they were 10 or 11 in the, in the car as they were being driven to school what's right. nuts to me is that they're buying tickets to come to the shows now that's amazing yeah, it's really it's yeah and i i feel really fortunate i feel incredibly blessed at that and i, th I think part of it is that maybe it's just the nature of song is that it, it's, 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 it's hopefully that the work is lasting and people mm -hmm. are have have had ten years to gain a relationship with the music, and it has been part of their lives for ten years. And and in 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 that way, uh, yeah, it's it's you know, and and maybe music is is special in that we can you can discover a song at any time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can discover an artist from the eighties or seventies, fifties, but you gain what you create in that moment as you discover it is something that's spontaneous and, and is happening now. You create. A memory you create a relationship with that work and that's of of the moment and if you could buy tickets to go and see that artist now you would you know it, it doesn't that's need so true yeah it's interesting as you're saying this i'm reflecting on my childhood like my my parents would play when we go on like a, <clears throat> a trip or something like driving through to go skiing or whatever camping or something 
they would play the Beatles a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, a season of time where they'd play the Beatles. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know who the Beatles were until yeah. I did know who they were because they started playing it. And then I got to hear all these songs and I was like, wow, this is so fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, whatever, 40 years later, then these songs were hits. Yeah. I discover them. Totally, totally. And probably have a relationship with those, with those songs in the same way that somebody did in the, in the 60s in some regards. Isn't that interesting? You know, I mean, yeah, I, I think, I found that when I was rediscovering a lot of music that my dad would have played in the house that I was unaware of. I, when I first, when I was like in my teens listening to like 12 Bar Blueses, I was, I didn't, I, I had a, a feeling of like, oh, this is what home, listening to this music, like, this feels like home to me. Mm. But there was, there was something that was nearly like, I had been listening to um, like classic rock and roll, uh, like blues music, 12 and 8 Bar Blueses. He was in a blues band. He was in like, he was covering blues music. It, there was always tapes. He had like these tapes of, of the material that his, that his band was working on and stuff like from before I was born. Um, but I, I did notice that the, the music that, that just was always playing in the house, I had no conscious awareness of it when it was being mm. played. But then when I was a teenager. It was just in the background. It was in the background, yeah. And, but I was able to, I, had, I forged this relationship with it that, that I just felt very at, at comfortable with, at home with it. And uh, I don't know, yeah, I think that's, that can be powerful too, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's um, yeah, I think the relationship you form they say that, you know, when we evolved as, as into the beings that we are, that our auditory um, senses evolved long before our visual. Mm. So I, th I think there's something about hearing things, about listening to things. It's, there's something quite deep in it, you know. Wow. We hear our parents' voices long before we see them, you know. Um, so in some regards, we, we, I mean, we hear music before we engage in, in any other type of artistic medium. We're we're listening to music right uh, in the womb even before we understand it we're hearing it yeah yeah i'm curious in the last decade what has been the biggest transformation you've seen within yourself through this journey of success and experience and, and making all this art and what is the biggest thing you still struggle with today <laughs> really great questions but like very challenging ones and um, um, so the biggest thing you've learned about yourself and, and the biggest challenge or struggle you have today, yeah. even with the the success that you've created. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a school of greatness, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, totally. That's why, yeah. Um, yeah, got to expect those great, those great questions, you know. Um, but yeah, I kind of want to phone a friend. The I think, um, I think um, stuff I've learned about myself is i mean I've, I've done a lot of personal personal work I've, I, I used to think that realizing that uh, creating maybe this is one thing i can offer that being creative and creating and my relationship with with myself was also you know my relationship with the work is very often dependent on my relationship with myself you mm, know what do you mean by that that it's a thing. It's like whether it's self doubt or it's self criticism, and um, an internal monologue, that is that is largely negative. And um, something I took for granted my whole my whole life, it didn't catch up with me until a couple of years ago, when I when I realized I, I honestly felt I was never going to write another song. Ever really? Again. Yeah. Sometime during the pandemic, and um, I hit this kind of wall where I couldn't move forward anymore. And I felt I'd, I'd written my very last song. Um, and I, I had to come round to, okay, no, this is, this is, this is just, it's the same voices, but they're just louder now because there's nothing to distract me, you know? So and I think that was, you know, in the pandemic, that was part of- You weren't of able to tour, you weren't able to go out and distract yourself. Not that tour is a distraction, but you weren't able to, you, you had to sit still now. Yeah. And hear everything coming in. Yeah. And in, in some ways, tour is a magnificent distraction. And it's a job in which you're constantly putting out fires, you know, and every day is another little crisis, you know, and, you know, I still get, I won't say, would you call it stage fright? But like, I'm still having to regulate my body 
constantly I'm terrible. You know what I mean? Every day is like really. I'm, Oh yeah, ten before minutes before stage. stage. Yeah, I'm like, I can't do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's an element of like nerves and and like I'm not able. I you know I'm not able to 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 do this. It's so funny. I was joking with some of the band, and this is maybe a magician thing. We're two week. We had a, a few weeks break. I was a month into a couple of weeks after break, and I was I was trying to think. Now this is maybe because a lot of playing is muscle memory. You don't think about when it's automatic. You know. Um, but I was, I was trying to think to myself, it's like, how do I play that song on guitar? <laughs> I, said, I could <laughs> right, not right. visualize, yeah. or I couldn't visualize a fretboard. I couldn't visualize finger movement. And um, so, but yeah, no, there is, there's, um, there is, there is always this creeping voice that's, you know, and it's, look, it's immaterial. You, you, you find your way around it. You find your sure. step over it, you know, and you, and you ground yourself and stuff. But, um, yeah, but in, in, in so, but creatively, I think when you are exactly as you describe, there was no distractions, it, it, like in during the pandemic. So, but tour, tour is, there's plenty. There's always something to do, whether it's press, promo, mm -hmm. you know, meetings. I'm oftentimes releasing music at the same time. So that's looking at artwork, video wow. edits, mixes, mastering. And I'm constantly, I'll be honest, like constantly a little bit overwhelmed, like just a little bit under overwhelmed you know and like i'm just the nose is like you know you're on the an, line there's yeah, a nostril like, you know can barely breathe but um <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and part of me you know it's also realizing okay is this is this by design am i trying to keep myself up here interesting and because because you didn't want to face yourself maybe yeah or you just yeah you operate operate well in that space or you at least you function in that way but yeah <laughs> maybe it's not well but you're like you're operating yeah, yeah you're operating or you're you're yeah you're operating you're getting everything that needs to be done done and um, so pandemic hits and you that all stops and you have to face yourself i guess so yeah what was the biggest fear that came to you when you weren't able to go on tour you weren't seeing people and you had to turn around and face the parts of you that maybe you weren't aware of yet I can't, I can't recall exactly if it was a feeling of fear. There was a, there was a feeling of maybe sorrow that came with it and sort of, it's just a lowness, you know what I mean? Just a mm -hmm. sort of a, a very, like a, a, you know, and I think, I think anybody who's maybe prone to sort of depressive episodes or is, is you know, um, would be familiar with it, but it's this kind of, I just slowed down in all, in all, in all forms and I just felt no root. I, I saw no um ability to to write nor it was and any any attempt to make it was seemed impossible i also fully believe and this is a funny thing about when you're in that mindset i fully believe that i could not i did not know how to write a song despite all evidence against it i was like oh no i actually don't know how to do this um so how many songs have you written at this point oh like you know probably you know over a hundred or you know obviously ones that don't get released right but like, like yeah but like it's not like there's something i do do all the time but there's something enters into the mind and then i realize it's like oh no this has nothing to do with this this is something else so um again it's about relationship with self you know and and so that was something i learned uh what was your relationship with yourself like i think i, I didn't have much of one you know so uh and I, it was more just realizing, okay, I'm going to have to cultivate a very positive relationship with myself, you know, and actually kind of put, you know, begin to address the root of some of this stuff and put an arm around myself. And wow. just and actually, so that was the beginning of, 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 uh, one of the more significant changes in, in my life, I would say is, is tending to actually, t you know, in t by the time I was 30, actually, like, like tending to, let's say, mental health and a relationship with self, and, and, um, which I had, I had just avoided doing, you know, because I, I, I could sort of, I felt I, maybe I could work my way around it, or yeah. I could, I mm. could, you know, but once you can't run anymore, you know, it, it's, I'd sometimes describe it as the hamster wheel had to stop spinning, you know what I mean? And so you then you're forced to sit in your little cage, you know what I mean? So... And wow. <laughs> kind of look around and take it in and go, okay, made something not right about this. What is the thing that you realized about your identity with yourself or your relationship to yourself when you no longer were chasing or on tour or distracted by facing yourself? I think, I think it was, 
I'd say you could say it was, it, it was uh, defined by a, a large, I had a very large, a largely a combative relationship with myself. So I was absolutely at war with my self really? constantly. Yeah, yeah. How, how sure. did that look like on a daily basis? What um, would that be? It's like I couldn't have a thought without an, without an opposing thought, you know? So it's like my brain was kind of split in two that it, I'd have a thought and then a thought to combat with that. So, so like, no, that's not real. That's not true. This is the real truth. Yeah. This is real. And then, yeah, going yeah. back and forth. Yeah, or it's and but when in it, it, at times and like I guess like your state, you know, you're not always. Sometimes you're a seven. Some days are a three. Some days are a nine. Some days are you know. Um, creatively, it's like that could really slow me down because it's like I think this is a nice idea. I think this is beautiful. No, it's not. You know, so you I couldn't hold. I couldn't hold with one thought um, at the same time, oftentimes. So it was it was challenging. I won't go into the nitty and the gritty of of like my whole experience, but um, yeah, that's probably for another, you know. <laughs> you know <laughs> um, but uh, but no, it, it definitely put roadblocks up, you know. And I mean, so that was a big change when I started to address that. How did you navigate the process? And I'm assuming there wasn't. I mean, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. I don't know if in Ireland growing up, there was a lot of talk around mental health and having a good relationship with yourself and a healthy identity. And, you know, I don't know if there was or not, but how did you learn to develop that then during that time without having any of those skills or tools for the first 30 years of your life? There wasn't, there wasn't really, you know, and, and especially it's not something even, I mean, more so my parents' generation would have had any sort of, uh, not, not really, you know, um, uh, not in a kind of a this is something we can talk about it's right. a day, day to day thing you know kind of like suck it up and let's not talk about it and keep moving forward and just everything's good very 1970s you yeah, know yeah, very yeah. 60s and 70s but I'm I'm very grateful to sort of to 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 have access to to a more to be more present in in, yeah. in the day to day with my actual lived experiences as opposed to just um uh, yeah, just having this kind of wow, man. Yeah, so you're allowed. I mean, I'm I'm really grateful you're talking about this because I wrote a whole, I read a whole book called The Mask of Masculinity. Okay, um, yeah. seven years ago now. Yeah, where because growing up, I felt like I had to be you know this strong man. I could never cry. I could never show my emotions in school, sports, um, and it tormented me inside. You know, it tormented me emotionally feeling like I had to wear a mask to fit in and belong, mm -hmm. but it wasn't my truest authentic self. And when I hit about 30, that's when I started to unwind and start to navigate the therapy myself and reflect and heal. Um, and it's, it's, it was extremely challenging. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done is to let go of those masks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and open myself up to myself turn around and look at all the parts of me that I was ashamed of or afraid of or scared of or insecure of and actually acknowledge them and look at them mm -hmm. and start to heal the the little boy inside of me that still had a lot of guards up and fears and insecurities and doubts and shame and angers and resentments and all these different things that I was not proud of and started to integrate my current self with my younger self. Mm -hmm. And, and and mend the wounds, the emotional or psychological wounds that were stored in the body and the nervous system. Yeah. 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 To create alignment. Yeah. With the present and the now. And it was the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life, but it set me free. And as I'm sure you're you're in right now, healing is a journey. And I'm ten years deep in the healing work and I've never felt more free. Also knowing that you can't just stop doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. Like I still go to therapy every month. I still show up and allow myself to talk about it and process things in a healthy, conscious way, in a safe way. And I think it's really inspiring to hear you talking about this because I can only imagine the amount of pressures that artists feel to create art. Um, and, and I think a lot of artists tend to create from pain or suffering, it seems like. Mm -hmm rather than peace and joy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's probably challenging because you're sharing it with the world, but you also still need to deal with it yourself. And just a 
a probably a messy process. Yeah, I the whole sharing from or writing from. Also, let me just I just want to address. It's like, thank you, thank you for 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 sharing that, and it's it's uh, it's it is it's beautiful. It's also it's it's it's. It, very similar to what you what you describe, and I think I was thirty. Also, it took me thirty years of living in a way where we, where I realized oh, I can't do this anymore. Oh, I can't yeah, live yeah. like this anymore, and mm. I've waited too long to feel like I will. <laughs> I can uh, I can cope. You know what I mean? And, and um, it isn't interesting that no amount of success or money or fr- fame will give you that peace or freedom that you're looking for. Yeah, 100%. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But I think a lot of people, I don't think that's what you were doing. I don't think you were chasing that. Um, you were being an artist and it took off. Yeah. But I think a lot of people in society and the world are looking to accelerate their career, to have more status, to make more money, to have you know flashier things or success to fulfill a part of them that is insecure or afraid or yeah. doubting something. Yeah. And the more I did that and the more others do that, it doesn't solve the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You still have to turn around and look at yourself at some point. Totally. And I, I, I think it's largely unconscious and this driving, you know what I mean? This, But that sort of thing of drive, and I do think about this a lot, whether would I be driven to be, you know, because surely the work, it's this question, surely the work is enough. Like so if I just, if I just loved songs and... Um, and I just wanted to write them. Do I need everybody to hear them? You know, mm. what's 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 the why part go on of- tour? Why do this? Why do <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, why did I? Why did I need it? So there is. I, I sometimes wonder. You know, um, what what part of me needed to be witnessed? You know, or what what um, you know, and I think a lot of people who are driven towards work in the public view, and um, I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying, generally, there is. I think you you might be correct in that. There, we're there is a there. We're, all all of us are driven in some way from maybe some some unobserved place that that, in some way that all of us think, okay, if I get this thing or I do this thing, I, all my problems will be solved. All my, you know, we all imagine this picture in our in our heads, mm. you know, of of uh, that arrival point that just never comes. Or you get there, you'll see the picture, and it'll align with the picture in your mind. And then you, and but the feeling is 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 not there. Or it's still not enough. Yeah, you still want more. Yeah. Are you still comparing to what your peer might be doing? Oh, they're getting this opportunity, right? Yeah. 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 Totally. And it's something um, you shared about about you know that thing. It's kind of that self parenting thing of like mm-hmm. a, getting relationship with yourself as a child. And a friend of mine once described described it quite quite beautifully. I have to say of like getting to this point in that process of then looking out from some moment of their life and just reminding, pausing to remind themselves to invite their child to wa- watch it with them cool. and to to stand in space, either, whether through the, the window of their, of their home or at some event that they were at and to imagine in their mind's eye that their child was there and to say, hey, look, you know, look where we are. You did this, you know. And I, I, I'm quite moved by that, just to just to bring your child into that and go yeah, like, because yeah, yeah. there's some there's some sometimes there's a re, there's this sort of switch that happens where we think, no, I took I took myself away from these circumstances and I did all of this on my own. But to turn around to your kid and say, hey, you know, I want you to see this. Wow. And how how great you did, you know, and how you you did this, you know, and we did this together. Uh, isn't this cool? And just to to let your kid sort of smile at that. Like, that's you know? beautiful. And him, yeah. And I, I think it's that one. I think that's a, that is a life changing relationship thing. You know, I think with yourself, if you can do that. And but again, yeah. I I mean, I I had no language for this until I was after a few years was, ago. Yeah, until a couple of years ago. So I'm still. Why my reluctance also to speak too much on it is because I'm so early in it. You know. Yeah. But, um, wow, man, this is beautiful. I'm so happy you're talking about this, though. Yeah. Uh, and don't feel and, and you know don't feel like you need to open up about things here or anywhere until you feel you've processed things enough and you may never need to do that publicly either it's just I appreciate you know, it yeah yeah it's not a it's not a pressure here for that in any way um, but it sounds like you are in a journey of creating a healthy relationship with self that's what I'm hearing you say yeah I think I think so I think so I'm also I'm realizing that it's it's also imperative for 
the work I want to make. And mm. it's, it's also, it's like, it's an, it's like to not do it. I think whatever, when you start on, on that, by the time you're ready to sort of do your own little work on yourself, you're ready to realize that not doing this isn't an option, you know, or, or not, you know, or it's an option, but you've done that, you know what I mean? Or, or for, for what, what's ahead of you and what it is that you want for your life and you feel the, the experience of living that you would like to get to. It's like you realize, okay, I, I just kind of have to do this. What do you think, Andrew, is available for you emotionally, internally, and externally in the world as you continue to navigate this healing journey for yourself? What do you feel like is available for you or your mission? I think it's this is maybe not just necessary for the for the work as well too for being creative. I just want to walk in step with myself, and in a way that that feels aligned with myself and aligned with the work. Hey, you know? And and to to I guess to feel at peace in in whatever the the work is that needs to be made. Have you ever been out of alignment with yourself in this last decade with anything you've created or? opportunities you've said yes to where you fall afterwards uh that's not really what, what i wanted to do or but i did it for ego or because whatever reason it happens i won't give examples sure, it yeah. happens or you catch yourself you catch yourself on a thought of like um yeah there's always this sort of one more stone uh, to turn you know it's like i always approached things with like uh, leave no stone unturned it's like you know just do keep, everything yeah and i'll Every little, opportunity. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. And, or That can be draining and exhausting, right? It can right? be draining, yeah. And it's learning to say no to stuff is something that I'm still cultivating a, a relationship with yeah. and, or a, a habit of. I think, um, yeah, or I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real, and I think this is an, I'm proud of this trait in myself, but that extra hour that I'll put in or that extra 30 minutes or that extra hour, um, I can I can focus, hyper-focus on something in, that, in those last few you know, but but w what happens is sometimes I'll agree to to do something. And I'll be fully in my mind of like I do want to do this. It's like, would, would you do a little bit extra here and add more rather than take this break? Will I use this time to work? And it's like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. And then in afterwards, I realize, okay, why am I why am I feeling exhausted? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, I'm burnt out, and now I can't function. You know, I can't work as I want to work. You know, yeah. so, so I I do want to I do want to address. You know, hopefully. Get wow. better at that. This, I'm, I'm, this has been a powerful section, so I'm grateful we're talking about this, but I have a, a question about um, a couple of the things around your performance experience. Um, I, I feel like, I hope they get to come watch you perform live sometime because I feel like it's a spiritual experience for the audience to watch what you do. Um, I'm curious for you, what has been the most spiritual experience you've had while performing on stage where you felt like something is different here? I'm feeling something different. Uh, there's an energy that is elevated at a different level that I've ever been to, or maybe I'm seeing myself from a different place or mm. I'm forgetting the words, but I'm singing the word. Like, was there ever a spiritual experience for you that was so big and awe-inspiring while performing? There's definitely moving, moving experiences. I was going to joke that I think this, the spiritual uh, experience is for to be in the crowd. I've been in shows and I've and I've I've been in such elation. I've been like so ecstatic and kind of lifted by being in crowd energy and all enjoying the same thing. And maybe like, I was going to make a joke. It's like it's a like, the preacher is the least spiritual of all people. You know, the person <laughs> right, right, at, the, right. at, the, at the person at the top, it's everyone else is engaging in a spiritual experience. The uh -huh. preacher is, is, I'm just kidding. But, sure, uh, like, sure. but I think when I'm on stage, um, there's a kind of a flow state, you know, that you hope to, to come into. And it, that's another thing where it's like calming my mind. And this is all connected. It's all connected with mental health. It's all connected with we like wellness, but then also like... Um, mindfulness as well too and mindfulness was a big change for me it was realizing how many conversations were going on how unpresent my mind was you know even sometimes when i was on stage and wanting really? to just yeah it would it would it can happen it can happen and, and realizing i i you know ha t t remaining grounded on stage remaining present on stage so you're not um 
So, so meditating before shows, I find really, really helpful. And um, how would you get distracted on stage before? It can happen where, again, if I'm releasing music, um, there's a lot of emails that I haven't unanswered. I swear to right God, right before you're like, oh, thinking about it. Or yeah, but you could be on stage in the middle of a song, playing a chord and singing uh, lyrics, and in your mind, I'm not present in that. I'm thinking it's happened where I'm like. I didn't email back. Come uh, on, so, really? So, yeah, yeah, one percent. Holy cow! Yeah, oh no, you're doing laundry lists in your head while you're in the middle of like singing a song, and the crowd are doing their thing. And how is that even possible? It's... How do you stay? Fo- I mean, how can you create a performance while thinking about the email you got to send to Larry? Yeah, and, and management or something. Um, you know, it's, like... it's it's not great. It's like, and I don't. I think that I think the show potential. My worry is that the show. I think because it's muscle memory uh-huh. that you just can do it. Um. But it's it's it doesn't you don't feel great about the about the show you don't because you weren't present in it mm. you know so it's been a while now since I would there's also that's kind of before that's when my mind was totally just like haywire um so mindfulness you know meditation and stuff and um, super helpful that helps you keep pre- keep you present now on stage on yeah. stage yeah so as for spiritual experience definitely I mean I was in Mexico recently. We just did a show in Mexico. Where? Which city? Uh, Mexico City. So, oh, man. Uh, district, I, I've been going back. My fiance is Mexican, so I've been oh. going back and forth a lot. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, congratulations. Also. Thanks, man. Um, Thanks. Um, it's, I mean, it's Mexico's beautiful. I love it, man. The Mexico City is incredible, right? Yes. Yeah. I love it. Really it's beautiful. And the people are just so wonderful, you know? And, and I have never, you know, no disrespect to any other audience, but I like, there is something special about a, a Mexican audience like that. Now, we have a tour. I've never toured South America. Hear that Central and South America are incredible audiences. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, but, you know, but then um, we have a we have a YouTube channel in Spanish. Yes, with I'll over a f- million subscribers. No in way. Spanish, that this will be dubbed in Spanish as well. Oh, really? A- okay. And Portuguese. Oh, what? Wow. So the Spanish channel watching or listening right now, I'm sure they're like all typing in the chat. This is incredible. Um, you know, <laughs> they're gonna love you saying like Mexico's amazing. I'm delighted, <laughs> and it's absolutely true. I mean, yeah. I, I think I said it on on. There's something special. There's a like. There is a passion. There is a. There is a. An energy. There is. And but to be in a a, a, a city or a country that is not primarily English speaking, and to hear your words, to be so far from home and hear your words sang back to you. My first gig in in, in Mexico City was very very same in that songs were being sang to me, and um, louder than than had ever been sang to, in other. Primarily English speaking territories. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I was stunned by it. I was absolutely stunned. And it's not their first it. language. And yeah, yeah. And so when I, when I, my first gig in Mexico, I was like, this is nuts. This is, I've never heard a crowd singing this song. I can't remember which song it was, but songs that just crowds, some, some songs crowds will sing it to, some they're not, you know, some not so much. Um, I was staggered by it. And then, so this time around, it was just a few days ago, like last oh, week. Oh man, I should have, um, if I'd have known, I would have gone to it. <laughs> oh my God, not at all, not at all. Uh, but performing a song called Cherry Wine and um, the crowd had like done something really sweet. They'd, they'd handed out these red pieces of paper to put in front of their phone lights. So songs called Cherry Wine. So they had all these kind of cherry red kind of uh, cards that they lit the auditorium with and then, and, um, with their phones and, and just, they were just singing the song back like louder than really I'd ever heard it. And I just had one of those moments where I was absolutely present. And I, I, I sort of at the same time was just like, this is nuts. Like I wrote this song. I think I brought myself back to, I was maybe 22 when I wrote that song. And, wow. and I just kind of reminding myself, it's like, I wrote this once and I played it like to you know, a little bar and I remember the first time playing this live, like, like I just was brought back to, you know, I, I was present in two moments of like, of the beginning of that song and, and writing it first and performing it first and just now. And, and, uh, and I was just, t- I was really moved by it. I kind of had to, to, you know, I, I was, I was quite touched and um, by that support and that love. And, and, uh, so yeah, there's moments where I don't know if I'd call it spiritual necessarily, but um, just overwhelmingly fulfilling, you know, overwhelmingly yeah. um, good feeling. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's, that seems like a spiritual experience for me, man. You almost like leaped in time 14 years, I guess, thinking about when you were writing this in your parents' attic or wherever you were at the time, playing it in a pub for 
17 people. Yeah. And now people screaming it across the world back at you. Yeah. I, I was grateful also after the fact that I still, I still could be that, that, that feeling was still fresh for me, you know, that, um, and then I, I was, I could allow myself into going, you know what, this is really sweet and I'm mm. really enjoying this. And how do you keep it fresh when you're, you know, doing a hundred, 200 tour nights a year, singing the same songs over and over for over a decade? Mm. How do you stay present when it's not new for you, even though it might be new for someone else? Yeah. I think the, the challenge is staying present. And honestly, if you can stay present, this is, it's like the same where your morning, all of us have to get up out of bed. All of us probably get up, we'll brush our teeth, we'll make coffee, we'll whatever, get in the car and go to work, whatever, the, you know what I mean? Or like go about our day, you know, I don't, I don't commute necessarily, but like we all have that little, you know, <laughs> we all have that thing where it's like those parts of the day, which are so commonplace to us that we do them in auto, in auto mode, you know? And if you can, if you can steer the brain into presence and your experience of that drive to work, wherever your appointment, your errands is going to be like so much more, uh, engaging. It's going to be an experience in and of itself. You'll actually experience the world around you. This is so easy. It's so much easier said than done, you know, and when you're talking about mindfulness, but I think on stage, if I can be present in a song, it doesn't matter if I, if I, and I'm truly present in that moment and I'm letting the energy kind of off the crowd kind of come through to me and through me and, um, the energy of, of the song and whatever, if I'm kind of allowing a, a flow of that, um, and I'm present in it, it doesn't really matter if I've sang that, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times or whatever, five times, it's like. I'm, st I'm just present in it. And mm. I think that's, it's a challenge. Wow. We had um, Rick Rubin on recently, who is a, a, a big he's, producer. He's Rick Rubin. Yeah. Wrote, no, he, a, wrote uh, a big book on creativity. And um, <clears throat> I listened to the, the episode as well. Yeah, by the he's way, it's inspiring. Amazing. I mean, Rick Rubin is. Have you met him? Or? I have never met Rick Rubin. He's course, inspiring, man. He really what, is. A, what a force. Yeah. But he was mentioning something about, you know, an artist should really be thinking about writing art for themselves as if it was their own diary, their own journal and not writing art or making art for an audience, but making it for themselves and being willing to reveal it to the audience without the insecurity or concern of their own intimate thoughts and feelings around their piece of art, mm -hmm. which, is, which is probably one of the hardest things to do is like putting out your soul that you're really making for you but wanting others to experience it without being worried about criticism. How do you navigate putting art out there and being like, oh, I hope people like this and they don't give me negative feedback versus people are going to like it or hate it or whatever they're going to respond to it. How do you navigate you feeling good about it no matter what happens to it in the world? I will say before releasing, it's not so much a fear, but there's this sort of, there's this, maybe I don't experience actually where the fear is coming from, but there's a terrible unease. And I think usually before releasing an album, um, there's this awful purge of like cortisol that happens. And like, you know, <laughs> I've, I've talked to a lot of artists about this where like you're, you're in tears before the, before it happens and you're exhausted and the catharsis that you'd hoped you, you would get from it never arrives, you know? And Ew. so, um, there is that. I think there has to be, maybe there's just, there is some resource that you pull from that brings you to a place where you are in absolute um, commitment to the fact that the, that the, the work needs to exist, mm. you know? That it is, it doesn't matter what anybody has to say. Something, the song wants to be written. The song has, in some ways, and I sometimes think of it like this when an idea comes through, the song is asking to be written. It feels ready to be, to be worked on. Um, and to deny it that is, is kind of, 
it's 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 it going against your nature, what you know you kind of have to do, what you have decided you're here to do. And um, so there's something that is willing to be made. It's it's willing itself to be made through you. And it's like you either do it or don't. Right. But don't sorry, excuse me, don't get annoyed when somebody else has the idea because there's a lot of parallel thinking in the world as well too. And someone else is going to put something similar out. Exactly, yeah. And that actually happens. I mean, artists talk about this. I've certainly experienced it. You have an idea for a song and six months later you hear it on the radio and somebody else has, ah. somebody else has, has played with you the, the themes that you were thinking of. And it's we're all living in the same, similar societies or, or you know, so it's a lot of parallel thinking comes in because we're all very similar stimuluses, whatever it is. Um, but you, you have to, there has to, I don't know, there is a, there is a resource that you pull from that, that is just, you know, this needs to be made. And um, like, what was it like, you know, when you came out with your first song, um, that was a mega hit, what was the feeling before that launched mm-hmm. versus, you know, the most recent Unreal on Earth, you know, is the feeling still the same, you know, 12 years later, is there a different feeling at this season of life as an artist, um, you know? before you launched the, the recent album. And the feeling on the first song, I was so, like, I was such an unknown um, that I just was watching its its uptake slowly but surely. There was these moments where, okay, it was reaching another audience. So it's like, oh my God, it's like, that the video's been seen by 10,000 people. Oh my God, that was a huge deal for me at the time. And um, I think it was like, it, it got, it was like on the first page of Reddit or something, which uh-huh. at the time was like, you know, huge. It was huge, you know, and then it was, then it was starting to be played. I think some of the earliest, I think the first, one of the first radio stations that played it in the States was like Alabama Mountain Radio. And um, like it was being Shazammed and we were watching, like somebody was telling me, oh yeah, it's just been Shazammed in like parts of the world, parts of the States that I, I'd, I'd never been to the States. Mm. I'd never thought that it would, I would be where the music would be heard. There's, at this at this point, people in Ireland didn't know that I was an Irish artist, you know? Oh, really? Yeah, honestly. they they. I think the song had started to be played on Irish radio, but they they assumed that I was an, an, like an American import, you know, that I wasn't, they didn't know that I was from Ireland because I, I hadn't been releasing music all that long. And then there was this kind of, this kind of dark sort of gospel rock sound, you know, on, on, in that song, this kind of swampy sort of right. vibe. And then, um, yeah, so, so, it's different, you know. I think that you there's there's sometimes you miss being the underdog a little bit, you know. There's there's some there's a lot to be said for having something to that feeling, right? Yeah, having nothing to lose. The naive, like, oh, this is really exciting. It just yeah, yeah, exactly. And and feeling like ev- every every inch you gain is a, is a is a is a is a huge deal and is a big win, and you've nothing to lose, and you you have you can prove everything, but also if nothing happens, it's like it's okay, it's, you know, go away come back when you're when you're ready you know what i mean but it's so it's tr- trying to maintain that maybe there's there's something to be you can still maintain that sort of mindset a little bit of like of i think when you and this is also maybe something that you can or it's good to 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 practice or to 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 investigate or think about is when the stakes seem higher or you've like on your second or third release you feel like if it doesn't do something for you that it's somehow, you know, it could be a success by the metrics of what you would think beforehand or anyone else's, but we had, you create this idea of like, I don't know, you just, you want more from it uh-huh. or, you, you know, so that's. How do you navigate that? Like when you launch, you know, an album and it doesn't do the numbers in your mind, you're like, well, I hope it does this many downloads or streams in the first month or year. Yeah. And if it doesn't do that, or if it does do that, how do you navigate that expectation? I think it's always just about, I try to just bring myself right back to, because you, you do and you, you look, you work with, you partner up with business, like labels and stuff like that. And, and, and they wanted to win. You, you know, yeah. And they're, they're competitive by nature. And and, um, and it's great that you have a team that, that, that thinks like that, that wants to bring your work to, to, a, to a large audience. Um, and... There's a lot of different ways that different artists will think about this. In, independent artists, maybe, you know. Um, and what I have settled on is that if I believe in the work, I want to give it every chance that it can it can reach as many years as possible and let, let those years decide. Um, and I just try to bring it back to the work. Do I believe in it? If I believe in it and I love it uh, enough that I feel it's, it's worth releasing, it's worth being out in the world, 
I'm at peace with it whether it's somebody listens to it or it doesn't. I'm at peace with it if nobody listens to it. There's some songs that I'm, I'm quite proud of such that if they were if they were heard by a hundred people, I I would say that song is still of the quality um, that I wanted it to be on. Mm. The quality of the work doesn't change whether it's listened to listened by a million people or a billion billion times or it's listened by a thousand thousand people or a hundred people or ten people. The quality of the work doesn't change. Wow. Um, so I just try to bring it down to am I happy with the with its quality. That's beautiful. I think that's a good uh lesson for any artist. Yeah. Or author or anyone, it's like, are you happy with the quality? Yes. If you have a career or a business around it, sure, you want to figure out a way to make money and survive. But I think you have to be proud of the quality of work, no matter if it sells millions of copies or one copy. Totally. Totally. Does it represent you? That's beautiful. Yeah. Man, Andrew, there's a lot I would love to talk more about with you. We'll have to have you back on another time. But I want people to check out your, your new album, Unreal on Earth. Um, I want them to f- to come to uh, watch you live on tour, man. Yeah. Which I'm going to do one of these days. Please do. I they mean, can they can go to hosier. dot com for your tour dates and everything like that. Is right. Yes. Yeah. Tour dates. Unfortunately, I, I, not many shows left. Left. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but they can get notified when you do do more. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But they can listen to music. Uh, you're on you're on YouTube, Instagram, social media everywhere. Hosier everywhere. Um, how else can we be of service to you and support you today? Oh my goodness. Um, I think you've been of, of great, you've given me a huge amount to think about and, um, offered, offered wonderful space for reflection. Um, but not, not at all. No, uh, like you've just been, been your wonderful self. And Thanks. Thank Appreciate you for, it. yeah. Thank you for inviting me in. And of course. Leading of course. always with a very, very open heart. You know? Of course, man. Yeah. We're doing it together, man. Um, I've got two final questions for you. But I want people to go to your website. Where where where's the best place to listen to your music? Is it Spotify? Is it on your website? Is it um? Where do you recommend people listen? I mean, they can they you can listen on Spotify. You can listen on Tidal, and um, you know, uh, where's your preferred place? Um, does it uh, matter? I, I mean, it's it, I mean the, the sound quality on Tidal is better. I'm sorry, Spotify. Look, it just is, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, like vinyl is obviously going to be the 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 best. I mean, yeah. you can listen honestly. I don't really mind. I think uh, anywhere that p- people want to listen to it, if they enjoy it, if they're vibing with it, I'm cool. Thrilled. Anywhere, yeah, yeah. Share with your friends, listen to it, share with your kids. Before I ask these final two questions, Andrew, I want to acknowledge you because I know it's hard for you to receive compliments, but I want to acknowledge you for the journey you're on. I think, I think artists have a big opportunity to inspire and impact, but I also think there's a lot of pressure for artists to be the perfect role model and say all the perfect things all the time, uh, especially at younger ages. So I want to acknowledge you for your journey of being true to yourself and sharing your art with the world, having the courage to make art and put it out there, even if it's nervous for you, even if you get scared before you go on stage and you keep showing up for the little Andrew in you, the current Andrew in you, and for the audiences that love the art that you've created for yourself. So I want to acknowledge you for your journey and being willing to reflect and look within over these last few years for yourself and allowing yourself to heal or navigate whatever emotions you're feeling. So hopefully you can continue to serve in a bigger way to humanity and yourself and your friends for many years to come. So I acknowledge you for all of it, Andrew, and uh, just really, really great to meet you and pleasure to have you on. You too, you too. Of course. Okay, two final questions. This is called the three truths. It's a hypothetical scenario. Imagine. You get to live as long as you want, but it's your last day on earth. Live as long as I want, but it's the last day on earth. So you're a hundred, you're 200. How old okay. do you want to be? Okay. We're going into the future <clears throat> and you get to create all your dreams. They all come true. You make the art, you have the family, the lifestyle, whatever it is you want to have, you create it. Mm-hmm. Um, but for whatever reason on this final day of life, you have to take all of your work with you. So all of your music, we don't have access to it anymore. This conversation, gone, hypothetical. Anything you create, for whatever reason, you got to take it with you to the next place when you pass on. Hypothetical scenario. Um, but it, you get to leave behind on this final day three lessons, mm. three things you know to be true, you feel is true for you, that you would leave with the world. And this is all we have to remember you by, your content. If you could, like you went back in time, 
when you were on stage thinking of that song that you wrote 10, 12 years prior and you felt that time playing it in the pub for the first time on stage 12 years later when everyone's screaming it back to you. If you can jump forward 70, 80, 100 years to the final day and think about all the lessons you'll have learned, what would be those three lessons or truths for you? I want to finish with an easy question. <laughs> And it's so easy. Oh my God. I was like, um, three lessons or three truths. Um, I would say one is, is to, and this is difficult for a lot of people, I think in, in the kind of hyper real spaces or the, or the with like spaces like social media and stuff like that, you know, um, is, is remembering that each human being that you are witnessing their lived experience is, yeah, and as, is, is as, is as authentic and as, and as deep and as real as your own, you know, and um, that they're suffering and their, na- and their internal narrative, whatever, whether they're, whether they've done their healing or they haven't done their healing yet, that they are they're experiencing a, 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 a lived experience that is as, as, as deep at times as dark and as frightening as, as, as your own, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and the reality of that, uh, it's just, yeah, just to remind yourself of, of the reality of that. I would like to say, um, that at the same time, and this is something I, 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 I kind of borrow from this Seamus Heaney's uh, Nobel uh, when he won the Nobel Prize in his speech it's a beautiful uh, lecture and um, it's called Crediting Poetry mm. and he references a, a mass he was from Northern Ireland and in this he's, he's referencing a massacre that took took place um, but and he talks about a poem um, and how what the poem knows essentially like so what in the same way that the poem can credit, it bears witness to, in this one instance, it can bear witness to, it bear, bears witness to and knows a massacre is going to happen mm. in its telling of this story. It also must and can at the same time bear witness to and credit the gentleness in this instance of, of the comforting of one person, the squeeze of a hand. Um, in this instance, I, I encourage anybody to read his, 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 his crediting poetry, poetry lecture. Um, this, I will not abandon you, um, squeeze of the hand that happens between these two co-workers just before the massacre takes place. Wow. Um, and so he, he, he describes this beautifully, is at the same time that the work can credit, and we often do, we, we credit and we, and we uh, bear witness to and we represent and we tell the story of of the horror and the hatred and the massacre. At the same time, we can, and maybe it's imperative that we credit that there is the squeeze of the hand. There is the tear that is that comes from a place of love and comes from a place of compassion and empathy. So it, it's, 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 you know, I would say the actuality of love, the actuality of solidarity, not in any sort of wishy-washy um, sort of air, airy fairy type thing is that there is there is, we 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 don't question the actuality of violence we don't question the actuality of hatred but we don't really take seriously the actuality of solidarity that we we think of it in the sort of lofty political terms but it's like the love that you have for your neighbor or your or your spouse or your child or your best friend that's showing up for people that um I won't abandon you in this, you know. So it's um, and in the same way that a work can credit one, it, it can and must credit the other. And um, so it's a it's a that's a beautiful thought that I, I would say that there's a truth mm-hmm. in that. We're we're in a limited space, you know. We're on a limited rock here, you know. I think I think I often think that the ways that we go about and look at we we deal in business, we work with different people in business. And there is in this moment a kind of a perpetual, um, and I, look, I don't want to get too 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 political, but we sometimes think 
in terms of the, this sort of secular trance of the perpetual growth model. We're on a limited space here. We, we, there is a commons that we all share in, in the world that it is. And I think, um, um, I just think it's a, it's a, there is a huge amount still of investigation and really in, in, like investment into the thinking of, of viewing the world as a, as a commons, as a shared space that we just have to, have to, um, that we can't just extract from the, that we'll have to arrive at some point to some sustainability uh, right. practice, be that sustainable economics, sustainable resource management, et cetera. That's something that really, and, and again, it's in the abstract, increasingly not in the abstract, but I, I get so sad at the idea of for what humanity is and, and how far how, the chance of, of this earth becoming what it's become and like what us as human beings, us evolving into this, to have awareness, to have meaning, to have a sense of, and the fact that we could actually be at risk of, of, of in, potentially of, um, to the point where, you know, we, we, we consume ourselves or we, we, um, into some sort of, into some dark age or into an extinction event, you know, wow. it's, it's like really very sad. Overconsumption of everything. Yeah. 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 It just makes me very, very sad that we could lose, um, yeah, the, the progress of, of, you know, of society as, as we know it, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think that was one other thing. I probably had something far more uh, nice. <laughs> it's all good. More it's artistic all good, man. to say than that. But yeah, that's it's all that, good. That's it's beautiful, man. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, final question for you. What is your definition of greatness? I think, and uh, it's, 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 again, it's a tricky one for me. And um, it is a commitment to one's mode of being that is it's a mode of being it's a it's a and it's a commitment to an alignment of of the heart and the mind and the mm -hmm. spirit in in either the work that you make in the in the in the ways that you deal with people in the way that you engage with your community and um, and be the, you know and i think it's it's one that is to me, there's an, I have no sheer definition, but it's one with that is marked with a a, a mode of grace mm. and good faith, you know. And, but if you look, it's not always easy. But I think if you can bring that to the work that you're making or the the, the engagements that you have in, in the day to day, good faith and good grace with 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 people around you, and Ugh. yeah, and in some form of alignment with with your your heart, mind, and body, great. I think that that is, if you can maintain that mode of being, I think, I think, um, well, I think we all know people who manage to do that. And there's people in our lives that we, that we witness sometimes and we're like, wow, you know what, that's a really great person. Oh. And, and it may not be that they're, that they're, that they are, you know, on the way to some sort of what we imagine to be success or something like that, or some sort of like global or international sense of, you know, it's not that they're achieving some outrageous monetary or financial success or but but there there is in their being something that we just we can't help but admire mm. and that they are either in their community or in their family to their friends in their place of work that there is something undeniably great about that person and um, I think those to me are some of the markers of it you know there you go, my man, Andrew. Thanks for being here. Thank you very brother. much. Really appreciate it. Powerful man. We're all on the same page. Even the even the people we're ignoring, the you know the record companies, the managers, the agents, the people who are yelling, "I need this, I need this now." Ultimately, for everyone involved, if the artist makes the best possible work that they can, everybody wins.